So we're going to look at um, some qualitative views of how stresses look at depth. Yeah, go ahead. When you calculate the effects of stress, isn't there like a DO factor or something? Yeah, well, well it's, it's a, like a correction. We'll talk about that. So the, the original effective stress definition was like I wrote it. That's Ter Terzaghi's definition. Um, there is a, a coefficient in front of that called a BO coefficient that came around later as a, as a correction. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. For now, it's adequate to just think of it like it is because uh, in many cases, the, the BO coefficient can be close to 1 anyway. So it's a good approximation. Especially in, in hard rocks and shales, and the, the BO coefficient can be. So, uh, so let's look at sort of a visualization of how stresses may change at depth. And this, when it says normal faulting, this is associated with that Anderson classification. So, in a normal faulting regime. Of the two horizontal stresses and the vertical stress, which one is the greatest? Vertical stress, right? So that's, that's the definition of normal faulting in the Anderson classification, right? So we can estimate quite well the vertical stress, and we draw this line. One PSI per foot, right? So the slope of that line is one PSI. We can also uh, estimate the pore pressure if we can't measure it directly. And the pore pressure is just the hydrostatic, you know, a good estimate of the pore pressure is just the hydrostatic head of water column. Right? So that increases at or decreases at 0.44 psi per foot or 10 megapascal per kilometer. Right? So, so that's this line. So then the other stresses, the SH min and SH max, must be in between these two lines. You can't have the pore pressure, the pore pressure can't be greater than one of these values because you'll hydraulic fracture the rock. And because it's a normal faulting regime, they have to be less than normal stress. So they're in between. Right? And then they're just ordered, you know, by definition, right? SH max is always greater. And that's H min by definition. And so then really uh, the distance in between them, specifically the distance in between the vertical stress and SH min, which in this plot SH min is plotted with a plus, and the lines are just sort of error bars, if you will. They can be, you know, this is just a qualitative view, right? Uh, so the distance between the vertical stress and SH min, uh, we'll see soon, depends on the strength of the rock. Right. So the most common failure model for rock is something called a Moore-Coulomb model. And the Moore-Coulomb model just uh, basically says that the rock will fail when the difference between the maximum principal stress and the minimum principal stress exceeds some value. And so that's what governs this width. Okay. And that's, in this case, the maximum and minimum effective stress. Okay. So this is the case where we've just estimated the pore pressure. Now let's look at a case where we actually measured the pore pressure in some way to the extent that we have an overpressure scenario. Right. So there's some part of the earth, some, you know, possibly compartmentalized reservoir that is in an overpressure state. Now, so when we talk about overpressure, we just mean greater than 0.44 psi per foot. So, so that's the definition of overpressure. Okay. Greater than the hydrostatic head. So in that case, there's some, you know, possibly compartmentalization in this area that causes the pressure to increase. And again, just given those rules, right, the vertical stress doesn't change, and the, the other two have to be in between the pore pressure and the vertical stress. And this is squeezed down due to the fact that you know, the 
strength of the rock. So the distance between them is still associated with the strength of the rock, but this is associated with the effective strength. So since the pore pressure is increasing, the effective stress is decreasing, and this is squeezed out. <laughs> okay, so we'll see that soon with you know real numbers. We'll look at some examples, work some problems. <coughs> So here's the same view in strike slip faulting. In strike slip faulting, what is, where's the vertical stress? No, I mean, order between it's SH max. In where, it's in the middle, right? It's between SH max and SH min. And so that's what you see here also visually. Right? So in this case, four pressures have been drawn at the hydrostatic head, 0.4 psi per foot, the vertical stress, 1 psi per foot, and then SH min and SH max on either side of it. The distance between now SH max and SH min is governed by the strength of the rock. The same thing here. So this, that gets, you know, this distance between them will get squeezed down in an overpressure scenario. Yeah. Do what? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we'd be way out of the water by now. Right? We'd be down into the into the rock at this point. And this over, we're going to talk about mechanisms for overpressure, but it, you know, it comes from compartmentalization of the, of the reservoir in some way, and. Uh, same things like disequilibrium, you know, we're going to learn about them, but, you know, things like disequilibrium compaction. So this is pretty common. This phenomenon is pretty common in the Gulf of Mexico. Who knows why? Do what? No, not necessarily. That's why the Gulf of Mexico is quite productive. It's because deposition into the Gulf of Mexico uh, is sort of faster than, geo, than the fluid can diffuse, right? So f the fluid's going to always diffuse in the rock according to Darcy's law, right? It's going to move, migrate away. But if the deposition happens faster than it can diffuse away, it can squeeze the rock and cause an overpressure scenario. So who knows why the deposition rate's so fast in the Gulf of Mexico? Mississippi River. So same picture, reverse, reverse faulting. In reverse faulting, where's the uh, vertical stress with respect to the other two? <coughs> it's a minimum, right? SH min and SH max are greater than the vertical stress. Uh, so in this case, in this case, you know, you see there's, no, there's nothing between the vertical stress and the pore pressure, but in an overpressure scenario where the pore pressure increases, the effective stress decreases, and so this distance still gets squeezed out. <coughs> and of course, the pore pressure can never be, it can approach, right? but it can, never, it can never be greater than the vertical stress. Because if the pore pressure was greater than vertical stress, what would happen? Yeah, you could think of it fracture, but it would also just float it, right? The crust would just it would just float, right? It would fracture and it would just float. So uh, we'll see as an approximation sometimes we assume that the pore pressure to vertical stress, uh, the ratio of the two is one. That's called lithostatic. But never actually, you can never actually get there. 